Welcome to Real Possibilities with AARP. Hi, I'm Elaine Warner. I am your host for today's program. We are coming to you in your local community with AARP's purpose in mind, and that is to empower you to choose how you live as you age. Today's show is going to be about what happened in the Connecticut 2019 legislative session, its impact on older Americans, but whatever age you are, there will be ramifications for you, so we invite you to stay tuned. We're gonna talk about the budget. Yes, the infamous budget in Connecticut that we've been talking about for years struggling with. It's been a challenge. We'll talk about its impact on you. Also, ARP believes that you should not have to choose between a paycheck and caring for a family member or loved one. How will the passage of paid family medical leave uh, respond to that possible dilemma? We'll let you know about that. And uh, something that when I'm in the, out in the community, I hear about all the time, people's concerns for the fact that America pays the highest price for prescription drugs. We'll let you know how ARP is working on the national level with Congress federally and on the state level to help lessen the price of the high cost of prescription drugs and stop the greed. So let's get to it. Our show today, again, the legislative session 2019. It will play out over the next couple of years. So whenever you're tuning into this show, it will be relevant. And uh, we are going to focus on the impact on older residents in Connecticut, but it will affect all ages. And I am here to welcome our guest today, Anna Doragazi. Welcome, Anna. Hello. Thank you for having me. I, we, as I always say, we bring the experts. And Anna has lived and breathed the subjects that we are going to talk about today. Anna is on staff with the statewide nonprofit office of ARP. Uh, she is the associate state director, one of two. We do so many issues. We divvy it up to uh, work on behalf of all the older uh, residents in Connecticut and all their concerns and doing advocacy and outreach. And uh, Anna follows the policy and guidelines, the goals of ARP on both the, from both the state and the national level. So Anna, obviously the uh, 2019 budget uh, session, the legislative session has just concluded. Again, I want to repeat whenever you're watching the show, uh, the, the uh, issues that have come out, the resolutions, uh, the legislation will impact over the next couple of years. But first, before we get into the issues, if you can talk about the process. You're over at the Capitol a lot representing ARP again for advocacy and outreach. What do you do when you're over there? I know you have a cadre of our wonderful volunteers that support you. So your role and their role, what happens over at, over at, uh, across the street from the ARP office at the Capitol? Sure, all kinds of things happen across the street from the ARP office. Um, it, so just a kind of quick overview mm -hmm. of what the session looks like, how it works. Um, you mentioned that we recently passed a budget here in Connecticut. Mm -hmm. um, Connecticut has um, a biannual budget, so every other year, um, odd-numbered years, the session is a little bit longer. It runs from January to June. And during those odd-numbered years, the legislature, um, in conjunction with the governor's office, develops a budget to mm -hmm. cover the two-year period. Um, so that, during those budget years, that takes up a lot of the attention and the energy of the legislature. I, mean, I think we have a $43 billion mm. budget. Um, so it's, it's a lot. There's mm. a lot uh, that goes into it, a lot of attention that, that needs to, to be paid to that. Um, so the beginning of the legislative session is when we see uh, legislators putting out their ideas for the session. Um, when they're saying, you know, my constituents have a lot of concerns about this issue. Let's create a bill. Um, and from there, we see um, the public hearing process where members of the public are able to mm -hmm. come in and weigh in on issues. This is a great opportunity for our volunteers yeah. um, and for anyone right. to be involved in the process. Um, the legislature has a lot of different committees uh, that have different areas of focus. So they're transportation, um, human services, public health. So these committees hear bills that fall within those topic areas. Um, and something that is important to me in my role with AARP Connecticut is to bring in our advocacy volunteers mm -hmm. um, and to bring in, it, honestly, anyone who has something to say on these issues, to come before these public <coughs> hearings and to say, this is how this issue has impacted me, it's how it's impacted my life, my family's life, and this is why you as our elected officials should act one way or another. 
Um, so that's one way fairly early on in the process that we engage our uh, volunteers. Um, we also, at the beginning part of the session, ask our volunteers if they'd be interested to go out in their communities and meet with their state representatives mm -hmm. and state senators. Um, I think a lot of people have a sense that the legislative process isn't for them, right. that it's a process that kind of happens to them mm -hmm. instead of with them. Mm -hmm. And I think at AARP Connecticut, and part of my personal philosophy is that we own the process. We are the bosses of the mm -hmm. legislative process. Mm -hmm. So anything um, that I can do in my role to encourage um, our volunteers and encourage members of the community to go and to show up and to meet their mm -hmm. legislators, um, we do that early on and have great success both sides of the aisle. We have a very bipartisan approach um, at AARP. And our issues really resonate with legislators in part because you know, they themselves are 50 plus, they have parents, they have loved ones. Right. Um, and they know that the issues of people over the age of 50 are the issues that are really important in their communities. They have lived it. Uh, and the, Absolutely. I, I hear quite a bit over my years with ARP. I'm on staff as well, uh, volunteer engagement. We're going to talk a lot about volunteers here, and that's why Anna just addressed it as well, because we say that we could not do the breadth and depth of our work without all our great volunteers, and we'll tell you how you can explore that before uh, the program is over. But bringing the personal stories to the legislators mm -hmm. uh, that they're not going to hear necessarily in their offices at the Capitol uh, really plays very well. Let's uh, get to the budget and some of the things that came sure. out of it that had significant, and I, I want to say positive, you'll speak to it, impact on our older residents. Uh, let's talk first about the Medicare Savings Program. Yes. What, what was it, what happened to it, and what were the results? Well, and this is a perfect segue from what we were just talking mm -hmm. about, about having ownership over the legislative process mm -hmm. and the importance of people talking about their experiences. So the Medicare Savings Program um, is a program that helps eligible folks pay for some of their expenses related to Medicare. Um, it, it's a program that impacts, I want to say, 180,000 people in Connecticut. Wow. Um, so a very popular program, yeah. um, a program that helps um, especially older folks on fixed incomes who need to pay for some of their health care expenses through Medicare um, are able to receive um, a benefit through this program that reduces the amount that they're paying. Um, another really important part of the Medicare Savings Program is that if you are enrolled um, through the state in the Medicare Savings Program, mm -hmm. you're enrolled in a federal program called the Low Income Subsidy um, that's also called Extra Help. And <clears throat> this extra help helps you pay for some of your Medicare Part D expenses, so your, some of your prescription drug costs. And we know that prescription drug costs are a huge expense um, to, yeah. to seniors, but to everyone. everyone. Um, so the Medicare Savings Program um, in Connecticut has something called an asset, or something called an income test. So they look at your income that comes in every year, and if you're below a certain income level, you, you're eligible for different levels of the program. What the governor's budget tried to do this year was to add something new called an asset test to the program. And asset tests are common with other benefit programs, although um, we see states sort of as a trend moving away from asset tests. But asset tests look at you know, how much money is in your bank account, how much do you own in stocks and bonds. And if it's above a certain amount, you're no longer eligible yeah. for the benefit. Um, the issue that we saw with the asset test proposal for the Medicare Savings Program was that the asset levels were pretty low. So it was right around $7,500 for a single person and just above $11,000 for a couple. So if you think about, you know, you're, you're 65, you're low income, you'd like to enroll in the Medicare mm -hmm. Savings Program, you're looking at potentially another 10, 20, 30 years of life. And right. to say, well, you can only have, you know, up to $7,500 in the bank. Well, that's one major home repair. Yeah. That's you know, needing to buy a new used car. You're not necessarily wealthy, but your assets are going to be higher than that. Right, right. And therefore, you would be um, denied um, the benefits of the Medicare Savings Program mm -hmm. and you know, almost more importantly, that low-income subsidy. So yeah. you'd have, um, it, you wouldn't be eligible for those lower uh, prescription drug costs. So what did ARP do and why? Uh, to sustain the 
uh, uh, asset test that was in place. Am I correct about that? Uh, so right now we have no asset test in <coughs> place, uh -huh. um, and that was what we wanted to maintain. Uh -huh. um, so early on in the legislative session, we reached out to members of the community. We said, you know, who's going to be impacted by this? Mm. You know, help us tell your story. And yeah. we heard from um, community members, both volunteers and also people just out in the mm. public, who said, you know, here's how this would impact my life. Mm. And then we were able to take those stories and relay yeah. them to legislators and say, you know, did you know that this many, you know, hundred or thousand people in your community are about mm. to lose a benefit? Um, and I think something that helped us this year is that um, in the last budget cycle, the legislature um, passed a budget that would have changed the income eligibility levels for the Medicare savings program. Um, and that passed as part of the budget, but when the Department of Social Services started sending out letters to people that said, you're about to lose your benefit, mm. people really... Mm. It, kind of lost their minds yeah, yeah, and understand. uh, understandably, yeah. you know, really freaked out yeah. and called their legislators and legislators said, we, we can't, we can't do this. The impact is too great in our communities. And that, that was the power yeah. of regular yeah, constituents, constituents yeah. Yeah. Um, it really moving the needle on, yeah. on a bill and something that we heard in our advocacy around the asset test over and over from legislators was, I'm not touching this program <laughs> ever again. I heard from so many people yeah. the last time. Yeah. Um, so that really played in our favor, but you know, again, it mattered that people showed up and talked about the issue. So, bottom line, succinctly, the results of uh, our advocacy. Uh, no asset test. All right. Yeah, Good. they they took it out of the budget and um, will move forward as before. So, so no, those no 100, changes. One hundred eighty thousand people should be uh, very happy with that. They and should others, be. Yes. Others coming on board. So. Mm -hmm. uh, really good advocacy work there. Retirement income, uh, my knowledge that something positive uh, or maintained itself favorably. Yes. If you can briefly speak to that. Sure. Um, so um, again, a couple budgets ago, um, mm. we saw the legislature decided to exempt retirement income from uh, income taxes, so social security, pensions, annuities. And this was in, an incredibly popular move and something that legislators um, you know, in the last election cycle in 2018, really campaigned on in their communities. Mm. They said, you know, you're not going to have to pay income tax on your Social Security or your pension income anymore. And constituents said, great, I love that. Um, and they got a good response in the community. But then when the governor's budget came out, um, there was a proposal to repeal that exemption. So to, to kind of walk that back and um, all a those... money savings, obviously, uh, like yeah, the Medicare so it, Savings Program. Yeah. Yep, so it would have been cost savings. Um, but again, people heard from their constituents mm -hmm. um, who said, you know, you promised me I'd be able to keep this money. Mm -hmm. I made financial decisions based on mm -hmm. that promise. You campaigned on this. Don't walk it back. Right. Um, we, um, when the Finance Committee had their public hearing on the budget, um, AARP volunteers put on their red shirts and filled... It, you know, two I've seen front pictures. rows. Quite it it, was, it, it yes. was. It was yeah. great. It was a great day. We had a strong presence. Mm -hmm. um, and even just visually, all mm -hmm. of those folks there sent a message to legislators, yeah. which was, you made us a promise, don't break your promise. Right. And at the end of the day, they didn't. Right. And that, that impacted people at all different income levels. It, so every it, income yeah, level, everything. absolutely. So, well, again, successful advocacy. And yes. yes, you can make a difference, whether you're a volunteer, whether you're a constituent. Mm -hmm. uh, so applause for that. You know, I, I mentioned at the top of the show that ARP believes that no one should have to choose between a paycheck and caring for a loved one, a family member. Paid family medical leave did pass both houses, the House and the Senate, I should say. It did. In the Connecticut General Assembly in 2019. And why was that a priority, Anna, for AARP? So on the national level and then on state levels, AARP is absolutely committed to supporting family caregivers. Um, so in Connecticut, we have close to half a million family mm. care me caregivers that are in communities providing support to their loved ones. Um, and this support takes on a lot of different forms. So this could be you know, making sure that um, a family member or a loved one has meals or helping them with certain activities of daily living mm -hmm. if they're having a hard time getting around themselves. Um, in some cases, this is doing complicated medical tasks yeah. for your loved ones. Um, and 
right now, what we see in a lot of cases is that there are a huge number of these family caregivers that are trying to juggle those caregiving responsibilities with their paid employment. Right. Um, and it's really a struggle for yep. people. Um, and AARP has some great research out there that's been done in the last five or 10 years that looks at the impact of this juggling act. And it's hard on the people receiving care, it's hard for the people giving care. And our position is that you shouldn't have to choose between caring for your loved ones right. and receiving a paycheck. Right, very so, good. Yeah. So that, that uh, should quell some stress out there. And you know, we <laughs> never know when uh, the needs of caregiving are going to happen. Uh, many of us are living longer, uh, mm -hmm. but caregiving can occur at any stage. It doesn't matter what age you are. It could, it could happen to an individual yourself mm -hmm. uh, where you will need that. And uh, that was a long time coming, I think six years, Anna, right? Yeah. Uh, in the process. And so if a viewer wants to know, do I qualify for that? Or you know, just, just walk us through briefly, how does it work? Sure, so the way that Connecticut's Paid Family and Medical Leave Program is going to work is that um, employees are going to be eligible for up to 12 weeks of paid time off for personal illness or injury, or also to provide care to um, a loved one. And um, I'm gonna focus mostly on kind of that caregiving Right, because it does apply to um, newborns too. And yeah, you, you absolutely, in which, right? yeah, and there's, there's a lot of great data and yeah. statistics around, you know, why it's important for young right. mothers to right. be home with their children. And young fathers. Um, well, and young fathers yeah. as well. Yeah. Um, but from the caregiving angle, um, you need to demonstrate that you have a relationship that's, um, you know, a family relationship or a relationship that's like a family relationship. Um, and so you, if I may just ask you sure. this, so what if somebody is, uh, you know, living with somebody as a domestic partner, say? That would uh, be covered. Would that, okay. Yeah, and it, uh, this is actually a, an important piece of the bill. Um, we know that families look a lot different now than right. they did a generation ago. Very much so, yeah. Um, and people, you know, might not live uh, near their biological family, or they might have never married but have a domestic partner, or they might have a friend who lives next door that is like a, that's a chosen family member. Right. So this is really important um, for everyone, in particular the LGBT community, um, in particular folks who um, don't live near family members. But if you can demonstrate that you have, you know, this very close relationship, and this is something that this that's going to be administered as part of the program. It's not just you know, oh, hey, the guy across the street doesn't feel good. I'm going to take 12 right. weeks off of right. work. You know, right. th there really is a process for proving um, this caregiving relationship. And when, um, when does all this become effective? Um, so this is going to be kind of played out, mm -hmm. um, I think, over the next couple of years. Okay. Um, I'm not remembering off the top of my head the date when mm -hmm. um, we should expect the payroll deductions but to it's, start it's happening. Evolving. But yes, it's it's evolving. It's a work in process. It's going to be managed by a quasi public entity. Mm -hmm. So there's going to be a process for getting um, that administrative board right. set up. Um, the program is going to be funded by a half percent payroll tax. Just about to ask that. Yeah. <laughs> um, so it. it it really is a public insurance program, mm -hmm. so everyone pays a little bit into it so that during their time of personal illness or injury, or if they need to provide care to a loved one, they're able to um, get back some of their, their income that way and provide and care without having to worry about missing a mortgage payment or not paying rent or right. not putting food on the table. Right, and, and you've told me, and obviously you checked other states with what they're mm -hmm. up to, uh, and found that people tended not to, quote unquote, abuse, uh, it, you know, if there's fear in some people. Mm -hmm. uh, but we're, we do want to move on to prescription drugs, but sure. very briefly, just name some other states that have it and anything you want to say about that. Sure. Um, California has the oldest program in the country and mm -hmm. really is sort of the model for mm -hmm. everyone else. That's the state that we look to to say, you know, abuse mm -hmm. and fraud rates are really low. Um, and California recently expanded their program. It's been going so well that they're making the mm -hmm. benefits more okay. generous. Um, New York, New Jersey, Massachusetts, um, Rhode so, Island. Yeah, yeah we were yeah. the only sort of mm -hmm. state in the area that had not passed a paid family leave program. So it really is a national trend, and um, you know we're we're proud that Connecticut kind of jumped on the train with yep. this, and also did it in a way that's um, you know, very generous. And and again, it's been a long haul, six years uh, yeah, in the process. So anybody year. that was part of it, we certainly want to uh, thank you for that. And let me mention, uh, we're going to have up on the screen Anna's email. 
and her direct telephone number. But if you have some questions about this, I'm going to give you my information as well. But Anna, if you can just verbally say your email and your telephone number. Sure. Um, my email address is um, A-D-O-R-O-G-H-A-Z-I at aarp.org. So A-Dorgazi at aarp.org. Um, and my phone number is 860-597-2337. And that is a direct line right to her That desk. is my and direct my cell phone, too. yep. So between the two of us, as a result of the show, any questions uh, or resources uh, that you need about caregiving, uh, it covers uh, other areas other than caregiving, but today's show is focused on the legislative session 2019 in Connecticut and its impact uh, focused on older residents, but affecting many ages. Anna, when I'm out and about in the community, uh, there is an issue that seems to resonate, seeming to me, almost with everybody, and that is the fact that Americans pay the highest cost for prescription drugs in the country. Uh, other than obvious reasons, why is this a priority issue for AARP? This is honestly a life or death issue. Mm -hmm. It's an issue, I know you mentioned, you hear from people in the community all the mm -hmm. time. It's an issue that um, as soon as we started to get involved with it, this legislative session, um, I got emails, I got phone calls, mm -hmm. I had people stopping me in the LOB to talk about it. It's an issue that really resonates with people because either personally or you know, within their the context of their friends or family or community, it, we've all seen people struggle with the high cost of prescription medication. Um, for older residents in particular, um, we know that in the U.S., seniors take an average of 4.5 different prescription okay. medications on a monthly basis, and the cost of these can really add up. Mm -hmm. um, and other countries have kind of cracked this nut. We see lower drug prices across the world, and the United States continues to pay the highest prescription drug prices in the world, and it's... It's a life or death issue for people. Absolutely, and so uh, we're going to talk about this distinction between federal and state. But what are some of the solutions? Uh, should we talk federally first? What we're doing? Yeah, we we can talk federally. Um, so I think one of the issues that we see on the federal level is that um, big sort of buyers of prescription medication like Medicare yeah. um, aren't able to negotiate for lower drug prices. Yes, folks, Medicare is not able to negotiate that. And, yet. <laughs> and, and when Medicare Part D, the prescription drug program, was created, um, the pharmaceutical industry lobbied really, really hard to make sure that um, they had the right to set these drug prices. And they're setting them at levels that aren't working for people. Um, and if you look at other government entities that are able to negotiate prices. The Veterans Administration is a great example. Yep. Um, their prices are 80% lower mm -hmm. than what Medicare is paying for prescription medication. So imagine if Medicare had that same bargaining, pro bargaining power. We would see prices go way down and we would see fewer people struggling to keep up with the cost. Um, some of the issues um, that we're seeing sort of as national trends but that are um, being addressed in individual state legislatures um, are um, importation, which I'll yep. love to talk about more in just a minute. Um, we could do a whole show on that one. We I could. I, I we love, don't have time I today, but if you touch on it, yeah. Um, and um, there's a process called pay for delay that some states are starting to look at that we kind of briefly looked at during this legislative session in Connecticut. Um, just, and, just define that vote very briefly sure. in case somebody's wondering what yeah, that Yeah, so, so pay for delay is a, a tactic that the pharmaceutical industry uses to maintain a monopoly on their medication. Mm -hmm. So um, most prescription drugs, you have a 20-year um, patent, basically, on the medication. Um, and after 20 years, those generics are able to start to enter the market. But what some pharmaceutical companies will do is they'll pay their generic competitor to keep those cheaper generics off the market. So it's basically saying, you know, I know you have a cheaper solution, Elaine, but, mm -hmm. you know, here's a bunch of money. Mm -hmm. You're getting paid. I'm getting paid. The consumer is paying us so it's these a win, higher it's, prices. It's a win-win, not a win-win-win. It's a win for it's the It's a win-win-lose. Yeah. It's a win for the generics, but not necessarily for the consumer. Again, it goes so fast, so much to talk about. Just very briefly, what's happening in the state of Connecticut as far as helping to lower the cost of prescription drugs. We came this close mm. to allowing Canadian drugs to be imported into Connecticut um, it, 
Canada pays much lower drug prices. Um, some commonly used drugs are as much as a tenth of the cost in Canada mm -hmm. as they are here in the U.S. Um, we had a bill um, that would have basically set up a mechanism for these Canadian drugs to be safely imported mm. into the state. Um, it passed the House, great bipartisan support. Mm. Um, we had bipartisan support in the Senate, and the the clock just ran out. Um, you know, we were hoping for a vote that last day of session, and um, there were there were enough objections from just one or two state senators. Um, that kind of the politics got in the way and the clock ran out and we're hoping to see this issue get taken up, you know, either in this special session or it definitely next year. It's it's too important to well, let it go Well, to away. be continued, Absolutely. right, for sure. Uh, ARK, AARP advocacy won't give up on that. We just no, we talked won't. about that with paid family medical leave and we saw what happened there. Uh, we've just got a minute to go, Anna. Special session, what's the special session? What could happen? Sure, so special session is basically an opportunity for the legislature to come back and finish any unfinished business. Mm -hmm. Um, Governor Lamont has already said, you know, I expect to see you all back here in a couple weeks mm -hmm. to deal with transportation and tolls. Mm -hmm. So we know that um, transportation funding and tolling are going to be on the table for this special session. We're hearing rumblings that maybe also we'll talk about Canadian drugs, mm. but uh, that is to be determined. Well, stay tuned. Stay tuned right here, too, on your local public ac access station on the I want to thank Anna thanks for being here thanks I uh, for having me. you know we both live and breathe this you more than I do on the issues because you're back and forth to the legislative office building in the Capitol but I always learn more when I, I hear from you so I hope that was true with you as well as a viewer the subject of the program today the Connecticut legislative session 2019 how it impacts on older residents of Connecticut but everyone quite frankly so we've got a budget in place but that goes on for a couple of years and evolving legislation if this has sparked your interest, paid family medical leave, the high cost of prescription drugs, what's happening with the Connecticut budget, topics we haven't even covered, uh, consumer issues, the high cost of utilities. Uh, obviously, there's a presidential year coming up mm -hmm. next year. We always work in a nonpartisan, issue-oriented way. So if you're interested in knowing more about any of these topics and or you're interested in hearing about volunteerism with ARP, you can call me on the Program Specialist for Volunteer Engagement with AARP Connecticut, Elaine Werner, 860-548-3169. If you're a member of AARP, 600,000 strong in the state, we want to thank you for that. We hope we've empowered you to choose how you live as you age. That is the purpose of AARP. We look forward to coming back to seeing you in your local community, and thanks for watching.